Free and clear of the chatter from Wall Street, you're listening to Talking Stocks Over Beer, hosted by hedge fund veteran and newsletter writer Mike Alkin, who helps ordinary investors level the playing field against the pros by bringing you market insights and interviews with corporate executives and institutional investors. Mike sifts through all the noise of mainstream financial media and Wall Street to help you focus on what really matters in the markets. And now, here is your host, Mike Alkin. Tuesday, July 31st, 2018. Welcome to the podcast. Hope you had a good weekend. Yeah, it's been steamy here in New York. It's been, uh, the temperature has been in the low 80s, but the humidity has been in the mid to high 90s. And uh, man, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's those type of days where no matter how high you have the AC cranked, you come out of the bathroom after a shower and 10 minutes later, you feel like, oh God, I got to go shower again because it's just, you get no, you get no respite from, uh, from the moisture. But, uh, but you'll, you'll, re- you'll realize that when it's winter, I'm complaining about the cold. And when it's the summer, I'm complaining about the heat. <laughs> just, just my wife says like, what weather do you like? You know, so uh, we joke around about that. Anyway, it was a, it was a good relaxing weekend. Um, you know, I've, I've, for so long, for so many years, you know, my hobby has been work, right? It's been, it's been, been my family, uh, is, is my core, uh, and work has been kind of my hobby, but I've, as I'm getting a little older, I'm trying to <clears throat> get interested in doing some other things. And, you know, I, obviously sports, I, 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 uh, still play hockey, uh, you know, and in the summertime it tones down, but, but, uh, I think I was mentioning for those, if, if you're new to podcasts, you, you wouldn't have heard this, but if you listen, um, you know, uh, a while back, I said that over the winter time, I tend to, I'll put on some weight. I could put on those 10 to 15 and then the spring comes around and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get back or the summer comes around and I'll, I'll start to quickly, uh, drop some weight. And, uh, I, I'd probably put on more than the 10, 10 this uh, winter. I was, I was saw myself interviewed or doing an interview. I forget which it was. And I looked and I'm like, God, look at that stomach. What the, what WTF, how did that happen? So, uh, you know, I quickly, I, I, I got the diet back in order. I started working out a little bit more. And, uh, uh, but about a month ago, I uh, started, I, I, have a heavy bag at the house and I have a little gym area and I, uh, which is even more of a disgrace that I even put on 10 pounds, uh, in, or 15 in the, in the, in the winter, because it's, it's about, uh, you know, right downstairs. So, uh, I, but I have a heavy bag and, uh, the last month or so I have every day been spending 20 to 35 minutes just punching the heavy bag go online, go on YouTube, find some boxing workouts. And it is, I got to tell you, I, it's spectacular. The, well, first for the weight loss, I mean, it, it just comes off really quickly. Uh, but you know, I, unless I'm playing a sport, unless I'm skating up and down the ice or shooting some hoops, I hate cardio. You know, I have a spin bike. I get on there. I'd rather walk on broken glass, but I do it. Um, but, but this, this workout, now, granted, I'm not getting punched in the face, right? So everyone, as Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, so, you know, it's all beer muscles that I have uh, hitting a heavy bag. But but I have to tell you, for those 20, 30 minutes, it is, it's mentally spectacular. You just, you know, you, you just, you, you know, you might take a, a little bit of a rest, a, a 15 second rest uh, every few minutes, but but it's it's fantastic. I don't know if any of you haven't tried hitting a heavy bag I, for my, for my money, it's, it's a great workout. So, uh, anyway, I got that going and I think, you know, it's so uh, hobby wise, like I said, it, it's been mainly work and reading and more work and reading for 20 plus years. Uh, but I, if you have been listening to the podcast, you, you'll know that I, I stumbled across, uh, well, first, the first one with, with binge watching on Netflix, was uh, uh, House of Cards, which was a while back, and I hadn't watched it, hadn't watched it, and then my wife and I watched it, and we were hooked. And then we recently, uh, this year, uh, one of our, one of my listeners suggested Blacklist, and uh, Blacklist is just, I mean, it was spectacular. We couldn't, couldn't stop watching. So I've kind of gotten into this little bit of a binge watching thing, and I find for me, 
it's really mentally soothing from spending, you know, all my time talking to management teams or reading uh, annual reports or quarterly reports, uh, building spreadsheets, going out in the field, doing research. It, it's it's kind of nice. And so when I, when I get a little bit of time, I'll, <clears throat> you know, late at night, I'll, I'll do some binge watching. Well, well, this weekend we, we, we've got a new one. Uh, and it's something, you know, typically it's, I like to binge watch the political dramas, the, the crime dramas. Th those are, those are really exciting. Uh, 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 Homeland's another one we, we watch a lot, but, but this one is called the turn Washington spies. It was originally on the AMC network and, and you can catch it on Netflix now. And it's, it's based on Alexander Rose's book, Washington Spies, the story of the America's first spy ring. And it covers the events from 1776 to 1881 about a farmer from Setauket, Long Island. Now, I, I live on Long Island. I was born and raised. We lived away from Long Island for a number of years. So, we, you know, we're uh, totally local yokels. But uh, so... Uh, you know, it is, uh, but it, it's it's essentially the these local farmers in this uh, town called Setauket, really an unlikely group of spies called the Culper Ring, and it helped turn the tide during the Revolutionary War, and uh, it begins in 1776, uh, after the British had recaptured Long Island, Staten Island, which is a borough of New York City and and New York City, uh, for the Crown, and when they did that, it, it left George Washington's army uh, really in, in dire straits. And I, I have to laugh because the, <laughs> the first several times we were watching it, I didn't realize it was a true story, and nor did my wife. Um, uh, she's, an, she's, she's a CPA. Uh, I have a degree in accounting. Uh, history was not our strength. <laughs> But I mean, we're fans of it. And as we're older now, we like to take the kids to, to Boston or Philadelphia, where America's culture is very rich in, in history. Uh, and, you know, living living on Long Island, not too far from New York, you don't realize that how much took place in New York City, downtown lower Manhattan. I mean, we kind of knew it, but they don't do anything to really s celebrate it, to accentuate it. If you go to Boston or Philly, man, it's jumping off the page. This is Americans history and culture. New York, not so much. It's just got everything else going on. And and out here on Long Island, you know, to get to my sister-in-law's house, I drive right past to talk it to, to <laughs> didn't know anything about it. I knew it was a nice, pretty town. Uh, but, uh, and there's a lot of history here, a uh, ton of history here that it just gets glossed over. So, uh, you know, when you're watching this, it's about farmers and settling the land and they were they were in these tiny little communities and they were building their own homes and they were doing all this 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 stuff right that that everyone did back in the 1700s and and it, my my british friends will laugh who are listening because when i travel around the uk uh, on business with them they they they'll say now this castle's been here since the 1400s or the 1500s and they laugh at the america's history as to how small it, uh, you know how short it is but and they know it so well uh you know, I could talk to them about the Mets and the Islanders and the Yankees. And even though I'm very well read uh, and know I know a lot of geopolitical stuff, for some reason, what took place here 200 plus years ago uh, is something that I hadn't really spent too much time on. But but watching that, it was it was great, right? They were they fixed stuff all the time. So my wife said to me, she said, you know, um, you uh, uh, the the cushions on the outdoor furniture, you know, they, when you sit on some of them, you you sink, right? I said, yeah. She said, can you fix those? I said, absolutely, I can fix those. And she said, I'll, or I can call a guy in. I said, no. And, and here I am. I've, I've been watching a couple of days worth of guys fixing stuff and building stuff. I said, I got it. So, and I went on YouTube. How do you fix that? First of all, I didn't even know what it's called, right? So, it took me 15 minutes to figure out what to look this stuff up, what I'm trying to fix. So, I, I get in the car, I go to the hardware store, and uh, I, I conclude I need a staple gun. And um, and with the staple gun, I, I could stretch the elastic that's in there, and I could do it. And my wife says, just don't spend crazy money because you always go to a hardware store and come back with tools that you don't even know how to use, which is true. 
Now, my neighbors know if they need something, they could come here because I have a lot of tools. I just don't know how to use them. Or if I do use them, I do it wrong. But like I said, I, I, I in the past podcast, I grew up with a, a longshoreman and he was a mechanic also. So I don't know, there's something deep down inside of me that says at least I should have the tools. Um, so, so I have them, but I go, I go to a hardware store. I buy this monster staple gun. I, I ask the guy, is this going to work? Yes. And uh, we also put a, 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 a new outdoor carpet on, on our, our patio and it was coming up a little bit. So I was going to do the, uh, get some double-sided carpet tape. And, uh, here, here I, I go, I buy it. I come back. I, I read everything I ask. I don't ask for help in the store because I, it's like asking for directions. I know what I'm doing. So I, I come back. My wife says, now, did you ask the guy? I said, honey, I didn't need to. I, I, I read it. This is what I need. She said, but why wouldn't you ask? I said, cause I, I can read. She said, but how do you know this, this is the right staple gun? How do you know it's going to go through? I said, because it says it's, it's heavy duty. She said, but that doesn't mean anything. So she, she was out, she went out for a little bit and I started my project, aluminum frame, every doom, load the gun, took me 15 minutes how to figure out how to load the staple gun. It's not a regular staple gun, but still, I mean, come on, I should be able to figure it out, how to go on YouTube. So I find it, I, I staple, bouncing right off of it. And I had told my wife, I said, by the time you get back, these will be done. I'm telling you. She said, I really, I said, yep, no, nothing works. So now I try and get some screws. I try and screw them in. Doesn't work. I don't have the right drill bit. So I spent between going to the store, between trying to fix this two hours, complete waste of time. But here I am thinking that I got this all figured out because I'm you know, I just watched this stuff. I've got to, I could go get the tools. I could figure it out again not a shot. So then I work on the double-sided carpet tape. I put the carpet tape on, I stick it to the bottom of, of one of the carpets because we have an area rug outside. And, uh, and I had to use it. We had to do something because it, it's starting to, it's coming up and I don't know why our prior rug didn't. And we have a fire pit. So you could, you know, take a header right into the fire pit. So you want to be careful there. So I, I get the double-sided tape. I put it on, I peel it off. I put it down. Boom. I walk on it, got it great. So I said, okay, she'll come back from the stores and at least I got one out of two things done and I'll, I'll just, you know, just say that I, you were right. On, I'll concede on one of the two. And she told me she wasn't sure if the double-sided carpet tape would work on this blue stone. I, I, I got it, it works. So I go in, I finish it, it looks perfect. I go, I, I come inside and uh, she comes in the house, she said, what happened? I said, what do you mean? She said, you didn't, you didn't do the, the frames. I said, well, you know, the, I had the wrong staple gun. Um, she said, but I, I thought you had that figured out. I said, well, I, I don't. She said, I thought you were going to do the carpet. Why, why is it sticking out? I said, I did. I went outside. It was completely up. Nothing worked. So long way, a long winded way of saying is I don't know when that time's going to come where I'm going to say my, to my wife, yes, just call the guys and have them come in and do it. But, but it, I'm starting to get there because I, two, three hours on, I'll, I'll do projects and they just, I can't, I can't finish them. So anyway, that was, that was part of my weekend. Um, but the turn, I really recommend it. If you like revolutionary war, you like history, you like intrigue, you like spy stuff, but that, that's my latest thing. Anyway, so, you know, I don't, um, you know that I'm not going to, I told you several weeks ago, I'm not going to get into the weekly, what the market's doing, because who cares what, what, what anyone says, really, because everyone has an opinion, and we know what opinions are like. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to call the overall market, right? Um, and uh, I am bearish. We know that. I've talked about that before. If you're a new listener, I am bearish. Um and uh, I'm not going to get into all the reasons why. I'll, I'll maybe somewhere down the road I'll, I'll, I'll get more into it, but not today. Um, but but I'm not going to go thing for for thing. And, and where, but one of the things I talk a lot about uh, earlier in my podcast was you know the markets had a huge move, and I think it's time that you need to start you know really thinking about how your portfolio is positioned because stocks have moved so much that you want to be cognizant uh, of weightings in your portfolio. Um, and you know. If you've been 
owning an index fund, a lot of, or, or a large cap mutual fund, you know, you, you've been riding the wave of the S and P tech sector, which has been uh, outperforming like there's no tomorrow. Um, but, but this past week, I think is a good example to, if you do own this stuff that you really want to start to pay attention, you know, notice I, I mean, Facebook, which has been one of the, you know, one of the fangs, uh, real, real darling, one of the most loved stocks. They, they they announced what was really a pretty astounding cut in its operating margin outlook that didn't sit well with the people who own these big growth stocks, that the growth investors don't like big margin cuts. And uh, the stock was down 20%. I mean, its, it's market value was cut by $120 billion. Now, that 120 billion is the largest single day loss of market value in US stock market history for any one stock. It was it wasn't as so it was the loss. stocks go down 20%, <clears throat> but the speed at which it occurred, I mean it happened like overnight after they reported numbers the stock got crushed and it just continued to to get crushed. And and if it served one purpose, if you didn't own the stock or you don't own an ETF, or if you do, whatever. Yeah, I, I think it it made the market pay attention to the crowded positioning that you're seeing in specific stocks, and and, and specifically in the in the tech sector. You know, it, it's the, the tech stocks have been steadily going up for years now, and it, it's pushed the the sector's market weight as a percentage of the S and P 500 to its highest level since November of 2000. Remember 2000, <clears throat> right before the internet bubble and the dot-com implosion, right? So at that time, the S&P information technology sector was about 35% of, of the S&P 500. <clears throat> it's not there yet. It, it sits at about 26%, right? But <clears throat> it's getting there. If you looked at a chart as a percentage weightings, it's it's starting to really go, what I'd say, a little parabolic up towards parabolic, going straight up, not quite straight, but it's it's going up. <clears throat> so, you know, um, it really starting to take off. And if if you look at, you know, Facebook had a market cap of about six hundred and thirty billion dollars, and then you look at Alphabet, Google had a, had a market market cap of 900 billion. Apple is approaching a trillion dollars. So if you own an S&P 500 index fund or an ETF like the Spider, the SPY, or the triple, uh, the, the Qs, the Invesco uh, QQQ Trust, you own these stocks. And if you own a, a very actively, uh, an actively managed large cap mutual fund, you, you, you probably almost certainly own these stocks. So, so what that means is your position is owned by countless other people, and that weighting of these tech stocks is high, right? So think about Netflix got hammered in the last couple of weeks. Uh, bang, one of the bangs. Uh, we saw Facebook that I just talked about. So, so that sh that should be an eye opener. I mean, stock loses twenty percent of its market value in minutes. So it, it, if it serves as nothing else, it, it should be apparent that the risk is high in owning some of these right now. Um, you know, you look at Amazon had a really good quarter, kind of blowout numbers, I, I think you'd say, and the stock after market was up 4% or so, and it, it barely finished up. Pre-market trading, yeah, it was 4%. But throughout the day, it substantially weakened, and it closed up just half a percent. Right, so you know that that could have been uh, Amazon's been a beast. Yeah, its stock's been tremendous, and I think after Facebook, you'd think Amazon comes out with great numbers that it would uh, take in these stocks higher, uh, but it didn't, and and it itself barely budged. So you got to wonder, are, are how toppy is it? And, uh, you know, the, the whole tech sector uh, finished ways behind the, the other 10 groups for the week. They it lost 10%. Intel got hammered down almost 9%. Uh, 
Um, you know, they had a slower rollout of some next generation chips, which really overshadowed uh, better than expected uh, second quarter earnings. Uh, Twitter got hammered down 20, 21%. They had a decline in monthly active users, disappointing guidance. So just something to think about. Again, I'm not sounding the alarm bells, but if, if you are heavily weighted, you might want to re-examine your weightings. So anyway, on to other stuff. Uh, this past week in uh, in uranium world, uh, the we saw a significant news. Mercar, uh, Cameco, the largest publicly traded uranium company, uh, they uh, announced an indefinite shutdown of the world's largest uranium mine, uh, MacArthur River, which is up in the Athabasca Basin uh, in Canada. Uh, they produce about 18 million pounds a year. It had been on temporary shutdown. Uh, and um, we had, uh, uh, the market wasn't sure what they were going to do. Uh, they shut this thing down back in, uh, they announced it in November last year, and they shut it in January. And the plan was for a 10-month shutdown. And they were going to keep it closed, uh, hoping that that lack of supply hitting the market would impact the price of uranium uh, to move from uh, the low 20s up to where they probably wanted in the mid 40s before they uh, would get it going. But the market wasn't really sure. Uh, Cameco uh, uh, was somewhat late to shut uh, production during this seven year downturn that the market was in, the uranium market. Uh, but they announced uh, last week that they're keeping it closed. And, and we've seen the price of uranium rally. It sits at almost 26 bucks a pound in some of the stocks. Uh, not all of them. There was some bifurcation in the group, but uh, it, it, uh, some of the uranium stocks started to really uh, move, uh, uh, but but that's a lot of supply coming. That's ten percent of world supply. That's not going to hit the market. And for those of you who follow my view on uranium, I think the world is in a uranium deficit right now. Uh, and I've I've thought that that I've been very public since uh, last year uh, that that was my view. That's what's going to happen. And so uh, there's a lot going on in the world of uranium now. Uh, because it's the summer, because it's hard to get people, today's interview was interviewed, I interviewed it in the middle of last week, uh, right before this news came out, but it, it pertains to uranium, and it's a uh, it's the CEO of a uranium company, and uh, we're going to have Amir Adnani come on to talk about macro uranium stuff. Without further ado, Amir Adnani, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Mike, nice to be back. Hey, I'm sorry I didn't get to see you out in Vancouver last week for a Sprott conference. I uh, I, I was understand. looking forward to it. I was all ready, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you just last minute decided to stay home and take I it did, easy. You know, I got so busy with a couple of things, and uh, you know, I said, yeah, I'm just going to have to pass on it uh, this time. Uh, but but you know, we did the big takeaway from the conference for me was a Facebook Live video I saw of Frank Curzio flying a plane. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance. Did, did, did he tell you about his piloting experience? Yeah, I think he briefly mentioned it to me. I, I th and I think he enjoyed that. He did. But they the, the definition of white knuckled experience can now have a picture of Frank's uh, in, in next in, in the in the Webster's dictionary holding tightly onto that wheel as he was piloting or that stick as he was piloting the plane. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, so t g g g Folks, uh, Amir was at the uh, Sprott Natural Resource Conference last week. Uh, Amir is the CEO and, and, and president and board member of Uranium Energy Corp. And, uh, and Gold Mining Inc. Uh, he's the chairman of Gold Mining Inc. Uh, but Amir was at Sprott. And Sprott is a, an annual get-together for a bunch of natural resource companies. And, and uh, a lot of investors uh, go, go there and meet with the company. So, Amir, what I mean, you've been going to these for a while. What was your takeaway from the conference? Well, I mean, it, it, it is a very different kind of conference, mainly because, uh, uh, as, as you may, I mean, you're aware, but just for the audience's purpose, uh, if they're not familiar with Sprott, uh, Sprott is really an, an asset management company. I mean, they're an investor in, an institutional investor in the resource sector. And so this conference is unique in the sense that um, a company needs to be invited to be at this conference. Um, you have to basically be owned by Sprott or Sprott has done significant due diligence and uh, they invite you. And so, I mean, to begin with, it's always been 
um, you know, it's, it, it's been quite nice and, a, and an honor that um, guys like Rick Rule, who uh, have been shareholders of both uranium energy and gold mining in a big way for many years, um, uh, continue to invite us back. And, we, and, and, and it, so it's a great opportunity that way. But the other obvious thing is that you can, you can imagine, you know, being a very natural resource focused conference. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, weakness across the commodity sort of board uh, recently with the U.S. dollar being stronger, gold being uh, uh, really kind of struggling here, being at closer to 1200 rather than 1300 copper prices coming off. And uh, with uranium, I feel like, so, so, you know, naturally you figure that the mood would be a little bit subdued. But if you're a hardcore right. uh, contrarian natural resource investor, you almost sort of maybe uh, live for conferences like this and times yeah. like this in the cycle. And I tell you, with uranium, it felt to me like there was almost kind of the calm before the storm, so to speak, in the sense that I think many people attending there recognized that there was um, uh, something really positive developing in the uranium market, that we were going to have many exciting months and years ahead of us for the sector as this recovery begins. And uh, generally, there was kind of a very upbeat yet subtle uh, kind of uh, uh, response towards it. So very interesting conference, always very well attended by natural resource investors. And, um, you know, I, I would imagine, Mike, that at conferences like this, we would see a greater number of generalist funds or investors as we start to see gold and uranium prices at 10-year highs as opposed to 10-year lows. Yeah, it's interesting. Amir, before we hit uranium, I'm, I'm going to throw you a curveball that I just thought of while you were talking, and you mentioned gold. And, and it's you, know, you are chairman of gold mining. I am not a, a gold bug. I am not a gold aficionado. Um, I, you know, I have a view, kind of, sort of. But what, um, what moves gold? Up, you know, Dollar up, dollar down, interest rates up, interest rates down. No matter what scenario it seems, and, and Frank and I were talking about this yesterday, just having a chat um, on the phone. You know, gold's kind of stuck here in the low 12s. What, what's your view on 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 just gold itself? I mean, what what's what's how do you think about it here? I mean, it's almost a, a, a kind of a compliment to say it's stuck in this range because it's, yeah. Been, yeah. <laughs> it's been going down. <laughs> but I, I, I just I, my views are this. My views are that you know we 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 end up with these let's say um, short term and medium term uh, dynamics in the market that uh, that drive gold. So the big one being uh, the U.S. dollar. So here we are over the last uh, sort of 60 days. Due to events that uh, you, you look at what's been going on in Euro, you look at what's been going on in Italy, there's just been this uh, relative sort of uh, strength in the U.S. dollar relative to what's been going on to generally every other currency on earth. And so that's been the driver, I think, in the last 60 days. We also tend to see geopolitical events kind of events move the gold price. But it almost seems to be so short-lived when that happens, and and it, and that 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 historically has has been supposed to be gold's role in the world. We get some geopolitical uncertainty and gold moves, hasn't really been the case. And so I really believe this is about a longer-term trend when you think about gold. And I think when you think about gold, you have to think about the longer-term effect of what trade wars uh, and uh, the fact that we're coming out of uh, uh, one of the longest you know, bull markets ever in history, one of the longest cycles of low interest rates. What does it mean when we come out of this? So to begin with, trade wars and anything to do with tariffs and things like that, these are inflationary. We end up with rising inflation, which is going to happen. Uh, then ultimately, we're going to see lower real rates. And I think negative real rates, so nominal rates adjusted for inflation, uh, are going to be the, the, the key driver for the gold price. And I think that's the ultimate relationship that I'm looking for. So uh, even if you look at where the bond market is sort of pricing in further rate hikes, I think everyone is quite su sort of suspect of how many more rate hikes the Fed can support. And, and I think here there's going to be a greater velocity of rising inflation than the interest rates. And again, hence we'll end up in an environment where we will have uh, a negative, uh, negative real rates. And, and I think that's ultimately what's going to bring the gold price out of this sort of six-year bear market that we've been in. And we're going to sort of head back and retest uh, the 2010-2011 highs and uh, 
um, and, and, and especially given where, you know, total debt worldwide is right now, total household debt, total corporate debt, um, this is an environment that um, I would be, I mean, I, I look at gold almost as insurance, Mike. I look at it as, an, as insurance and a hedge uh, uh, against all these possibilities that, uh, uh, that I see in the market. Okay, great. No, that's that's helpful. I I, I appreciate your view, and we shall see uh, where where it takes us. So let's get back to uranium. Uh, I mean, there's you know obviously for those who are new to to listening to me or new or listen to me but haven't been paying attention or cared to listen to about you uranium. You know, it's it's uh, it's been in a seven year bear market. I, I personally think the bear market is over, but. Uh, uh, the price at one point of uranium was $137 a pound back in 2007, and today it sits uh, in the spot market at about $24 per pound, having hit a low of about 17 uh, over a year ago. And uh, the number of companies who who mine and, and explore for this stuff's gone gone down from several hundred down to below really 50 publicly traded. And if I really sharpen my pencil, like there's a, a Fair amount less than that uh, that that I think are worthy of investors' capital, uh, and uh, you, you know nuclear nuclear power accounts for about 12% of world electricity production, and in the U.S. it's about 20% of the electric grid. And, and a lot of people might not know that, so if you're new to this, uh, it, it might that might come as a little bit of a startling number. Uh, and and from a worldwide uh, perspective, it, uh, the nuclear power industry is a growth market. It is bifurcated between the OECD, the developed countries, and the non-OECD world, the developing world. Uh, in the developed world, uh, it's you know flattish to some countries are uh, reducing the dependency or eliminating it. We've seen Germany uh, and, and Switzerland uh, want to go away from nuclear power. Uh, France has talked about reducing their dependency, and, and the French generate a three quarters of their electricity from nuclear power, although recently they've, they've backpedaled on that. Uh, in the United States, uh, you know, low natural gas prices make it somewhat not competitive for certain nuclear reactors. So you're seeing uh, some challenges there. But in the rest of the world, uh, where there's rapid growth and and where there is the need for clean air, think India, think China, uh, you know, you're seeing it it grow rapidly. And around the world, there's about over half a trillion dollars at least in construction. There's 58 or so reactors around the world under construction uh, off of a base of uh, 450 uh, reactors that are already out there. Uh, so it, you know, it, it's, it's a growth business, and, but the commodity is, is down uh, over 90% uh, from its peak. <clears throat> so uh, for contrarians and for people who like to look for companies uh, left uh, on, the, on the garbage pile and in industries where people have really forgotten about, that's you know, the uranium mining industry. Amir's business, Uranium Energy Corp, is a... Uh, is a miner focused in in, in the U.S. and uh, that's where uh, uh, and he, he, they do a process of mining called in situ recovery and and uh, uh, there's two ways to mine there's conventional which is either an open pit where you see the big trucks down there pulling the stuff out or underground and then there's in situ recovery which looks kind of like an uh, oil and gas uh, setup where they drill down into the ground and they they separate the uranium with a solution they pull it up through the pipes and they process it. Uh, but but I want to turn Amir and to to the U.S. The U.S. is a fascinating uh, beast in the in the world of nuclear power. As as I said, it's a, it's about 20 percent of the U.S. electric grid, and it accounts for 30 percent of nuclear power worldwide. And there's 99 reactors that operate in the U.S. And at one point, if you go back to the you know 80s when the Cold War really was at its peak. Uh, you know, the U.S., let's say, consumes, we'll round up, folks, it's about 50 million pounds a year of, of uranium to fuel the reactors. And most of the uranium goes towards reactors, very little for, for bombs and, and medicine and whatnot. But, but uh, back then, in the 80s, it was producing almost all that it was consuming. And, and it had a healthy nuclear fuel cycle. It had the ability to enrich uranium because uranium by itself doesn't power anything. It needs to be enriched. Uh, and now, now as you fast forward all these years, you know, you, you move forward about almost 40 years, uh, the, the United States produces less than 2 million pounds of uranium. And it, it consumes, let's use that 50 million pound number. And so 
we have to, the, I say we, I'm, I'm an American, you have to import uh, 98, 99% of the uranium it needs from foreign sources. And those foreign sources are not always friendly to the US. Uh, upwards of half are uh, Kazakh, Russian, Uzbekistan, uranium, and not uh, who, whose countries don't always have the best interests or don't have the best interest of the U.S. Uh, in mind. So, th so the and and the, and the enrichment, the ability to enrich, has been decimated. Right? There's no self-reliant enrichment capacity in the U.S. So it's it's taken a dramatic change for the worse. And uh, recently, uh, the two companies. Uh, in the U.S., Energy Fuels and UR Energy, petitioned the Commerce Department under something called Section 232 on the grounds of national security, which was enacted back in 1962 to really protect industries uh, from foreign sources of, of materials coming into the country that could damage U.S. industry or companies on the grounds of national security. And I think one can make a pretty good case that uh, the uranium is is one of those industries. And, and and they petitioned back in January of 2018, uh, the Department of Commerce, and, and the Department of Commerce recently opened an investigation into it. So Amir, as a, and, and it will take, it could take up to nine months for them to come to a conclusion, and then they make a recommendation to President Trump, and he has 90 days to decide what to do with it. So it's kind of in a bit of limbo right now. But Amir, as, as a U.S. miner, could you talk about the state of the U.S. uranium mining industry, how we got here, and 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 your views on where this all kind of uh, how it unfolds? Yeah, so I mean the the state of the industry has been in this uh, status of um, low activity or kind of being closer to a historic low um uh, uh for uh, well over a decade if not maybe two decades so i mean it, it really kind of has this can trace its roots back to um uh, the end of the cold war era and uh the beginning of um an agreement between us and russia called the heu or highly enriched uranium agreement where uh, tens of thousands of uh uh, I think in total, when it was all said and done, it was over 23,000 uh, Soviet-era warheads that were dismantled, and the highly enriched uranium was blended down to low-enriched uranium, and that was uh, fed into the market, primarily the U.S. market. And that was the equivalent of the world's largest uranium mine. The HEU program was providing um, over 20 million pounds a year. You know, the world's biggest uranium mine because the river produces 18 million pounds per year. So this was a big source of supply. Uh, kind of flooded the U.S. market, and uh, uranium prices uh, uh, fell too low and lower than what was economic to mine uranium and to look for uranium in the U.S. In 2005, when I started as an entrepreneur to look at um, the uranium business, I recognized and saw that, oh, geez, look at this. The U.S. is importing 90% of its uranium requirements. That doesn't seem like a sustainable picture. Um, and that's how Uranium Energy Corp was formed. Uh, little did I think that 13 years later, we'd be importing 98% of the uranium requirements. And so while we've built a, a, you know, a business with fully permitted projects to mine uranium in Texas and Wyoming, we don't want to deplete our uranium at the bottom of the cycle. So things haven't uh, picked up for the total production of U.S. uranium, but here we are in a very acute situation where uh, the uranium being mined in the U.S. is only enough to meet the needs of one out of 99 nuclear power plants in the U.S., uh, and those nuclear power plants are generating 20% of the electricity in the U.S., and so uh, ultimately, I think what we have here is um, uh, perhaps a period of time where Many other countries were able to develop assets or projects that in the previous uranium cycles uh, had some kind of advantage over U.S. assets. But I tell you, as we move forward and we think about the next 10 to 15 years and ask ourselves, where will new uranium projects be developed? Um, I don't necessarily think other jurisdictions have any key economic advantage over U.S. assets. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have a 20 two dollar per pound uranium price clearly twenty two dollar per pound uranium price doesn't work even for the world's biggest uranium producers the canadian company cameco and the kazakh company kazakhstan and i say clearly because 
these guys have been shutting down mines uh, and announcing production cuts uh, over the last 12 months and signaling and stating to the market that we can't make money at $20 uranium. And so the environment that we're in, which uh, is a difficult environment, is not just difficult for U.S. companies. And I think this is so important for your listeners, Mike, to understand, because the moment we start to talk about uh, Section 232, and it kind of reminds people of how Section 232 is being used uh, or has been used for steel and aluminum and putting tariffs there and an automobile industry, um, tariffs have this negative connotation that it's trying to it's an attempt to prop up an industry that's not otherwise competitive. I think it's important that people understand, yes, we have a very difficult situation for u s uranium industry and that the industry is about to get wiped out almost because in terms of how little production there is, but it's the same for the rest of the world the The, the global uranium mining industry is is not able to uh, make ends meet at $20 uranium. So this is not a U.S.-centric issue. And cure for low prices is low prices. This happens in any commodity. And I think the key here is to say, as the sector comes around, as the commodity price globally recovers, um, how competitive are U.S. companies? And I would say companies, especially those that are focused on institute recovery, this is the low-cost way of mining uranium, in the U.S., which is the, the specialty that we have at Uranium Energy, these are very competitive projects compared to what we see in the world. Most feasibility studies that have come out on new Canadian projects that are pre-production need $50 uranium and higher. Incentive price for most mines in the world outside of Canada and Africa and elsewhere is $65 uranium and higher. So clearly everyone needs a higher uranium price as an incentive price to develop. Uh, and when we look at sort of this issue, I just think um, um, that there's a foundation in place in the U.S. Uh, to discover new uranium deposits, to, to be able to almost replicate what the oil and gas industry was able to do over the last decade or so, right? Where, um, you know, this is a very interesting perspective that um, uh, the chairman of our company, Spencer Abraham, has, because as, a, as the 10th U.S. Energy Secretary, um, under uh, George W. Bush and his administration, they were deeply concerned that 50% of oil requirements for the U.S. was being imported. And mm -hmm. that problem has been solved today. And, you know, it's been solved by really uh, making it a core focus, both in terms of tapping into geologic potential, tapping into American ingenuity, tapping into uh, this kind of collective base that says, yeah, this industry is important, and let's turn it into an economic engine. And I just think the U.S. uranium industry is not an industry that um, needs to be propped up. I think it's an industry that is very strategic uh, for uh, energy infrastructure, Department of Defense and others need it for uh, nuclear Navy needs it. And that ultimately, I think this is an industry that can become a global powerhouse. I think it can become an economic engine. I think it can create thousands of jobs. And all you need to do is look at the history, his, you know, when we were – a much bigger industry. Uh, this industry employed over 20,000, close to 30,000 people, compared to 500 today. Um, so there's a, there's a very sound uh, argument here to look at. And I think what's also important is that, you know, this is not just about a Section 232 filing. Over the last year, we have seen so much support from different branches of the U.S. government uh, speaking in favor of U.S. uranium. Department of Energy, Department of Interior. Department of Interior has added uranium to the list of critical minerals. Department of Energy has halted a terrible barter program they've had for years where they've been selling uranium from government stockpiles to pay for cleanup. Terrible, terrible policy. It's finally ended. Department of Defense finally is chiming in and talking about the needs of the Department of Defense to run uh, aircraft carriers and submarines, all of which run on nuclear power, all of which need U.S. origin uranium. I mean, by law, you can't even put Canadian origin uranium for the needs of Department of Defense. It has to be U.S. origin. And then lastly, Department of Commerce that we talked about. But um, um, I, I think this, there's something much bigger going on here. And part of it has to do with maybe just a, a rebalancing of the market to some extent, Mike, because it, it's quite fascinating that Kazakhstan has become a single nation OPEC, 40% of global production in their hands from deposits where they're mining with the same low-cost institute method 
that was invented 30 years ago, 40 years ago in the U.S., and most U.S. deposits could be mined the same way. And hence, it, you know, you, it just makes you think, well, why can't we have that kind of industry leadership? And I think we can. So let's go back, Amir. That, that was that was very very good explanation. Let, let's go back to 232 itself. What 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 the filing the petition was asking for, which was they uh, they would like the president to mandate that 25 percent of the U.S. uranium needs be purchased from U.S. suppliers, which would be about 25 million. 25 uh, percent would be about 12 million pounds. So 25 percent, 12 million pounds to be purchased and. Like we said, the U.S. produces less than than two million pounds. Um, so some of the issues around that number one is, you know, w realistically, when you look around at all of the production capabilities of of the mines here in the U.S., what's the timeline that you think that twelve million pounds would be able to to be mined uh, in a realistic time frame, and and would that cause perhaps if it takes a little bit longer, would that cause do you think if commerce carries through, would, would it make sense to kind of uh, gradually ease into that 25% uh, if you were able to even produce that much? How do you think about that? Well, um, as, as you say, uh, as, as, as it is proposed right now, it's, it's supposed to be 25% of requirements. So if, if total demand is 50 million pounds, then 25% um, would be the 12 million that you're talking about. Yeah. But yeah. let's distinguish here between uh, requirements, uh, annual demand versus requirements versus when you need to buy. I think there's a natural easing period built in. What do I mean by that? Yeah, uh, the fuel cycle. Of very, <laughs> well, because of, well, because of inventories. If you're a yeah. U.S. utility and you're sitting on two, two to three years of forward demand on hand, yeah. well, you don't need to step into the market tomorrow and buy and and when you do be uh, demanded to buy twenty five percent from u s origin so yeah. depending on inventory management uh, uh, a u s utility could prolong the timeline or when um, the, you know the quota becomes applicable uh, and uh, and so that's important to keep in mind. The second thing is the fact that um, it is, I think, an issue. I think it's, it's an issue um, for the sector to ramp up overnight to get to 12 million pounds per year. Um, it simply won't happen. I, I, I don't know the exact time frame, but I can tell you it won't be months. It will be years. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is that the, the rate-determining step in, in developing any kind of uh, uranium mine in the U.S. is permitting. And uh, you know, I speak from direct experience. I mean, I've spent 13 years building uranium energy. We have uh, fully permitted uranium mines in Texas and Wyoming uh, with the full capacity to get up to 4 million pounds per year. So we can at least satisfy in initially 4 million pounds out of that 12 million. But, Mike, it took us five to seven years to get those permits. Okay? That's the thing people need to understand is that it's it, it, the key issue here, the key gating item or step is going to be permitting and it takes five to seven years so this is going to be uh, a story where if uh, the 232 petition or any other kind of policy that is designed to stimulate growth in the u.s uranium mining industry will create a premium u.s pricing a premium domestic pricing for uranium uh, which could last uh, for a number of years before enough production comes online to satisfy whether it's quotas or whatever the case is, and uh, then prices should normalize. And the domestic price over a longer period of time should not be that much higher than the, the, the international price. So, um, it, it, but, but frankly, I mean, I just don't understand why that should be an issue. And the, what I mean by that, Mike, is this. If, if there is a, a great concern over national security and energy security due to the shortage of uranium being mined in the U.S. and the heavy reliance on foreign imports, and especially on countries where there's a, a, a higher degree of geopolitical risk, then there, there needs to be a boost like this. There has to be uh, a, a great incentive provided uh, to stimulate growth and interest. And over the long term, uh, a key strategic objective has been satisfied. And like I said, this is something that really is just uh, evening the playing field. I mean, to, to some extent, I look at the fact that there are so many 
ways that other countries are incentivizing development and exploration in their countries when it comes to any kind of exploration, uranium in particular. I mean, you and I have talked about this. Like, look at the incentives in Canada which flow through financing, a mechanism we don't have in the U.S., but that exists in Canada. And people get a tax break by investing in companies that are going to go drill for minerals, including uranium. Well, that's an incentive. We can call it a subsidy, but it's incentivizing an action that otherwise wouldn't happen. Um, so to come back to your question, yeah, I think, I think the gradual process could be managed by utilities themselves and how they manage their inventories. They're not, they don't have to come to market on day one and buy U.S. origin uranium, depending on where they are with inventories. Uh, and um, uh, and the other thing I would say is, let's not forget, there's two ends to this equation. The one end of the equation is the uranium uh, and the fact that the fuel cycle uh, for nuclear power starts with uranium. But on the other end of the cycle, you have nuclear power uh, and the fact that uh, the nuclear power plants in the U.S. have been struggling economically due to uh, heavy amount of subsidies that were given to renewables due to uh, very cheap natural gas prices. But as the Department of Energy and the administration has done extensive studies about grid reliability, grid res resilience, they're realizing that we need baseload power from nuclear power plants. We need to uh, level the playing field for nuclear power, uh, given that it's generating clean carbon emission-free electricity around the clock, and it has characteristics and attributes that gas-fired power plants and, uh, and renewables don't. And so if you're a utility and on one end uh, maybe asked to buy 25% of your requirements from U.S. mined uranium, but on the other end, you're receiving some other economic incentive uh, where grid operators might be ordered to buy the electricity that you generate. That was a memo that was leaked from the White House uh, about a month and a half ago. It goes to show you that ultimately this is not just about uranium mining, but this is about the entire fuel cycle from uranium all the way to power generation and understanding grid reliability and grid resilience. And this has been a cornerstone uh, part of what Rick Perry as energy secretary has done. I mean, just look back to a year ago when uh, they, they published the whole grid reliability study. And I think that tells you the whole playbook of the bigger picture that uh, they're looking at here. So the utilities, right, uh, the utilities have, they're not going to lay down and say, okay, what, whatever you tell us. So they've, they come out with a counterpoint to being told where to buy their uranium. And they say, hey, if you, if you, Mr. Commerce Department or uh, Secretary Ross make, make, recommend that we buy 25% from, from the miners, that price could be bifurcated between a higher U.S. price and a, a lower uh, international price, uh, that's going to make our ailing nuclear power plants uncompetitive. Uh, so we we don't want to see that. How do you re how do you respond to, to to that defense from the nuclear power plants? Well, I just like I said, I think um, uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, fair uh, for them on their end to make that point. Um, I think uh, this is not necessarily uh, something we need to sort of point the finger just necessarily at them and, and single them out, but I think we need to just step back and ask some fundamental questions. I mean, uh, again, it, it, it should be concerning to anyone, uh, including uh, a plant operator and owner. Uh, when thinking about the reliability of uh, fuel coming in for uh, running a power plant, and it should be concerning if you have an over-dependence on import. I mean, these are just basic sort of uh, issues outside of economic consideration. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, the economic consideration has two ends to it, right? It has the end about um, uh, how do we feel about uh, nuclear power longer term having to compete with subsidized renewables and, um, and where does nuclear power's role kind of fit in when it comes to the very positive attributes that it contributes to the grid. And, um, and, and the whole discussion around uranium can't be looked at in isolation uh, on its own. It can't be looked at in a vacuum. I think it has to be looked at in the, in the bigger picture of where the grid fits, what kind of uh, diversification we want to have when it comes to the grid. 
Um, I think it goes back to, again, why we're seeing this incredible growth in the global uh, industry for nuclear power, why uh, from Saudi Arabia to China and India, there's record number of reactors being built because even the Saudis want to diversify their uh, electrical grid. They don't want to put all their eggs in one basket. Um, mm-hmm. They want, you know, I mean, all, it, it goes to the heart of that. And so we have this uh, tremendous growth taking place in the global nuclear power industry. Um, the U.S. could regain much of the leadership it's had in this sector for decades, which frankly it has lost to Russia and China. And Russia and China are using nuclear power and selling nuclear power reactors as, as a form of building political re- relations and exporting their uh, kind of diplomatic initiatives through nuclear power. Uh, and this is, a, this is a, a, a real strategic lost opportunity for U.S. companies and for U.S. interests. And so I think it's, it, goes, it goes well above and beyond um, someone sitting there and just looking at it in isolation as to what they're paying for a pound of uranium for 25% of their requirements. Well, whether that's 25%, 20%, 15%, 15%, we don't know what the final thing is going to look like. Um, yeah. I just think that what we do know at the end of the day is that nuclear power is a growth industry. And it's a growth industry that U.S. companies and U.S. industry um, uh, should be a part of. And you can't be a part of that, nor can you lead that if you are missing the most fundamental piece of the equation, which is the fuel, which starts with uranium. And without that, it doesn't, you know, what are you going to do, build multi-billion dollar nuclear power plants, but not have the most basic fundamental portion of that, that the lowest cost portion to operate a nuclear power plant is the uranium or, or you pay for a uranium. So this is, this is just not tactical thinking in my mind to be hung up on that. And we got to look at the big picture. I, I've been pretty vocal uh, when I when asked the question or in some presentations that uh, you know this this seven year bear market is has been somewhat self inflicted by the uranium mining industry uh, in this in in the sense that when when the price starts to dip below the cost of production and you're certainly not incentivized to produce one of the responses you can certainly have is to cut production and the uranium mining industry in my opinion has been slow had been slow to respond to declining prices. And I understand the, na- the, the reason for that is the nature of the, the market. Many of the uh, u- uranium pounds that change hands between miners and uh, power plants uh, occurs in a long-term market, which is a seven to 10-year market. And, and recently that's shifted a bit towards the, the shorter-term market with one to three years with, with the carry trade that's come in where financial intermediaries will 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 buy the uranium and then deliver at a uh, in a shorter time period but for security of supply purposes the my, the power plants want to know they have this uranium uh, under contract for many years because they think in, in in that term uh so you hadn't really seen a supply response until january of 2017 when when kazataprom the, the state owned entity of kazakhstan uh, cut production uh, they, that they announced back then uh, at the time at 10% um and then you've seen others with the biggest mine in the world, MacArthur River, owned by Cameco. That that was that was cut. Uh, they announced it in November. Uh, so you've started to to see that. But you know, people look back and say, well, it's been 18 months or so, and we've only seen the price of uranium move from you know high teens into low 20s, maybe inching up now towards mid 20s per pound in the spot market. And I've long contended that price discovery, real price discovery. Not not financial arbitrage or is trying to scrape by, you know, trading uranium back and forth like the physical traders do in the spot market, but real financial discovery for five million pound type contracts occurs in the in the in the long term market, and and we haven't really seen that uh, because the the nuclear power plants haven't had to because there's been a, some inventory out there and there has been the these the shorter term contracts, but now those contracts that they were entering into towards the latter part of, of, of the 2010s, 08, 09, 7, 10, uh, are, are winding down. And, and a third of the needs for uh, uranium are uncovered for 2020 uh, at the nuclear power plants. So price discovery needs to occur. And that, I think, is, is, is the miners, rec- uh, the power plants recognize that there's some, some uh, supply constraints happening now. 
But in, and in the back half of 2017, Amir, we started to see some requests for proposals from the power plants come out and and they wanted to pay low prices and the miners didn't bite. And I, that might have been the first shot across the bow from the uranium mining industry to the nuclear power plant saying, listen, we're telling you our costs are higher than we're selling it for. And then we and then nothing was really done in the back half. And then 2018 comes around and in uh, the latter part of January, you, you saw this Section 232 filed by uh, uh, uranium energy and, and energy fuels. And so if uh, the nuclear power plants have kind of withdrawn a little bit from the from the purchasing cycle. They've kind of gone on a hiatus saying, we don't know who we're going to have to buy this uranium from. Uh, so why enter into longer term contracts? But if you if you are sitting, put yourself in the mind of a fuel buyer and you're sitting there and if 232 does go through and gets a recommended, and we don't know that it will, but if it does, uh, you, you, you're probably paying a higher price for U.S. uranium. Uh, why not? Why not uh, be a U.S. nuclear power plant buyer, and why not start securing supply now uh, uh, and start dipping your toes in the water? Why? Why do you, are you, are you going to wait till the resolution of 232? Are you uh, or are you just going to start to secure supply now from those sources? Some of it. If you've only been buying a couple of percent, what's the harm in buying 5% or 10% or just some more now because some of the mines could produce and deliver? So what do you think the, the log jam is? I mean, it could be just the fact that, like we've talked about, uh, uranium just makes up such a small percentage of their overall cost that maybe they're actually quite insensitive to it despite uh, complaining that uh, they don't want to pay more. I think the other issue is that um, uh, this is uh, still uh, a kind of a to-be-continued kind of development, uh, and uh, maybe they don't want to get ahead of the curve and uh, start the purchasing uh, before there's some clarity on the exact outcome of what the administration wants to do. And then finally, I think it's just the fact that, look, even if you stepped into the market today to buy uh, U.S. origin uranium or any kind of uranium, uh, there just isn't supply available. I mean, this is a market that has really become uh, quite tight for different reasons. If it's U.S. origin uranium, this year's total production is expected to be less than a million pounds. Again, that's enough for one nuclear reactor, and there's 99 of them in the U.S., yeah. Uh, so there just simply isn't enough material. And if it's the global market, even that market is rebalancing. I mean, utilities are competing with the likes of Cameco in the broader global market to buy physical uranium. You know, Cameco not only has shut down MacArthur River, but in order to replace uh, the uranium that would have been mined out of MacArthur River to meet their contract requirements, they'll be buying uranium in the market. Could be 10, could be 15 million pounds. So. This could be just a case of total complacency by the utilities and uh, falling behind in uh, in what maybe they should be doing at this point in the cycle. But Mike, you know, I guess at the same time we could argue utilities have been burned before, where you know they 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 did buy and contract at the the top of the cycle back in 2007 and uh, back in 2010. Uh, and um, they've had it maybe too good for the last five or six years where prices have been low and they've taken advantage of that. And maybe at this point, uh, we're just kind of seeing the tides turning back in favor of uh, producers and sellers and the buyers just uh, not fully adjusting uh, the order book and uh, and their game plan and the strategy accordingly. Uh, what do you, some of the, you know, we talked about production capacity uh you know the U, uh, Canada and Australia are major suppliers of uranium, and and I think one could argue that the U.S.'s national uh, interests are pretty well aligned with the, the Canadians and the Australians. We all kind of have self similar self interests, and uh, we're we're very good friends. Um, what what do you think happens to the Australian and the uranium miners under 232? Those who are selling into the U.S. Do you have a view on how that plays out for them? I don't really have a view on it um, in the sense that, again, I think uh, when we look at other developments with 232 steel and aluminum being um, one that uh, is, is recent and, uh, again, has to do with commodities, uh, I, I think in the case of uranium, the argument is way more compelling. 
because we really do have um, uh, an over-dependence on foreign imports, and it really is a national and energy security matter. But in the case of steel and aluminum, I mean, again, initially, there was thought to be exemptions for Canadian and uh, let's just say mainly Canadian uh, suppliers, and in reality, uh, exemptions haven't been provided yet. Um, I, I think longer term, I go back to another issue. Forget about exemptions. Forget about uh, whether Canada is truly aligned with U.S. interests or not. I mean, of course Canada is. But I think ultimately it goes back to the point I made earlier, Mike, which is uh, Canadian projects to be developed in the next 10 to 15 years will also need a substantially higher uranium price than where we are to be economic. And so right. it becomes a bit of a moot point as to whether there's a quota or no quota. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I think people have to fully understand. The best new mine in Canada, Cigar Lake, has 10 years left in terms of reserves. Uh, projects like MacArthur River have been shut down indefinitely, but more importantly, uh, it, uh, you know, these are not brand new mines. These are mines that have been around for a long time. So new mines need to be developed in Canada. New mines need to be developed in Kazakhstan. And when we're talking about the global uranium uh, uh, mining picture not working at today's prices, then uh, clearly, again, uh, the, the, it puts the sanctions and, and or quotas or whatever we want to call them in the U.S. into perspective. And, um, and I think with or without these quotas, uh, ISR projects in the U.S. will be globally competitive in the next cycle for higher uranium prices. I believe they'll play a bigger role. I think investors will generally look at the IRR and uh, the economic profile of developing an ISR project in the U.S. with or without quotas way more favorably than developing hard rock conventional strip binding projects uh, in other parts of the world, and that's just not Canada and Australia. It could be anywhere, uh, and um, that's truly how I look at it. And I think again, if any kind of U.S. policy puts an added extra layer of incentive for U.S. production, it makes it that much sweeter, Mike. Right? Especially yep. when you're in our shoes as a company like UEC, and you know, never in my, never in our plans in 13 years of developing U.S. assets, being focused on U.S. assets, did we think we needed the intervention of government to make our projects competitive. But nor did we ever think the uranium price would get this low and so much lower than cost of production, marginal cost of production, and uh, the incentive price for the industry. And if it wasn't for long-term contracts that were signed in the last cycle, and the fact that these contracts kept producers going for longer, uh, to your point, the supply discipline wasn't there, and the, the producers should have been cutting mines sooner. But hey, they had contracts at higher prices. Yep. The market is finally rebalancing, and this is the most positive thing in my mind about the sector right now: that U.S. assets will be globally competitive, with or without these quotas. Well, you know, it's interesting, Amir. One of the uh, uh, one of the uh, pieces of work that I've done is on on the prospective projects that are out there that could come online. And, uh, you know, there's a natural primary mine shortfall versus demand every year for, for decades now, and it's made up by those secondary sources. So, but as you mentioned, Cigar Lake has 10 years, and you have other projects that are going to be winding down in the next handful of years. So you need new new mine development. And as, as I go through the 40-plus contracts around the uh, uh, projects around the world, with the exception of you know, a few smaller ones and, and one big one that won't be available for, for this cycle. Uh, you know, all of these projects require well north of $50 per pound uranium pricing uh, to be viable. And uh, it gets to something I, I don't see talk a lot about, but it's the project financing of these. So uh, whether, however you're going to finance it, whether it be 60, 70, 80% debt and the rest equity uh, of these major projects that will be required to meet the demand, uh, people will not lend on that without firm contracts in hand. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to finance that project, even if you had a board and a management that threw caution to the wind and said, oh, let's build it on the on the hopes of the future. I don't know who's going to finance that unless these projects have contracts in hand for 
whatever that price may be, 55, 60, 65 dollar uranium for those to even get off the ground. It kind of takes it away from uh, management's making poor decisions because they're anxious to get a project going. They won't get the funding for it. How do you view that? I mean, not to give you a long answer on it because I think you covered the points really quickly. I mean, I think that that it's exactly uh, the point here because majority of the production growth in the uranium industry over the last uh, decade has come from government-backed uh, projects, mainly Kazakhstan. I mean, this was all you know because Adam Prom has been a private, you know, government-owned or a sovereign wealth of Kazakhstan owns it or is the sole shareholder. So their expectations or uh, thresholds on IRR to and the hurdles to clear to develop projects would be completely different than the expectations of uh, a public company with uh, shareholders and stakeholders and financiers. And um, uh, and I think if Adam Prom's own thresholds and hurdle rates will change dramatically as they look to do their IPO uh, later this year or next year, right? Focusing instead on bottom line as opposed to top line, right? Instead of just growing production at any cost, uh, thinking about profitability. Um, and, and I think, by the way, that's a really fundamental shift in the sector. And I think if 40% of global production becomes sensitive to economic constraints, to profitability, to bottom line, to uh, IRR hurdle rates that they want to clear, that's closer to where the other 60% of the industry or production uh, has to deal with then that's going to create a much more normal uh, cost curve for the industry. I actually think the cost curve for this industry has been quite abnormal because, again, the majority of the production and cost curve is dominated by government-backed projects and initiatives where you just don't see what, what's really going on. But you just know government's cost of capital at any given day will be lower than what a small or mid-sized public company will be. So. Yep. I think that these are all very positive fundamental shifts that are taking place that will develop uh, into a much more competitive cost curve, a much more uh, 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 equal across the sort of spectrum cost curve where everyone's thinking about the same bottom line, same competitive economic thresholds, uh, and, um, uh, and and adjust uh, for these realities that maybe up until now have, have not been properly looked at. Don't forget, much of the production that's coming out of Kazakhstan also has its development and exploration history and roots in Soviet era times when uh, the Soviets uh, spent out of totally other government funding and initiatives and reasons uh, for what became deposits that then the Kazakhs have been ramping up over the last decade to become the world's dominant uranium producer. So that kind of history and, and, and that kind of uh, background uh, would not be available today. Uh, and again, uh, it's, um, it, it, these are probably one-off events, uh, historic events, that uh, had an influence on the uranium market, but we've now moved sufficiently past those events, uh, and um, every, everything is coming back into a proper equilibrium. I love talking to uranium with you. I really, uh, I really enjoy it, uh, Mike, because uh, you're um, uh, very unique in having been someone that's not uh, initially from the industry, but comes from a different industry as an investor, as a, as a hedge fund manager. But the fact that you have become such an, such a, such an expert on this based on uh, your analysis and fresh set of eyes, uh, honestly, is rewarding to me because, uh, uh, you know, as someone who's put uh, over a decade of his life into this myself and the money and time and energy that I've put into this as an entrepreneur building it, um, I have incredible conviction in what we're doing, but every once in a while, it's quite nice <laughs> to have someone from a whole other perspective and background uh, come to the same conclusions and uh, and and see the see the positive upturn that we see uh, uh, coming uh, in the coming months and years. So, always appreciate connecting with you and having these conversations. Yeah, same here, and and we'll keep the dialogue running, and it's going to be an interesting time. Uh, to see how it unfolds here, uh, especially for the U.S. miners. So, Amir, thanks for uh, taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Amir. I always find Amir has a, a good feel on the macro global uh, uranium market. And uh, 
We, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about uranium, uh, and I, I get a ton of requests, whether it's on Twitter or emails or direct messages uh, with questions. So, uh, you know, it's 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 a, my my goal is to bring you ideas that I think are interesting uh, or or topics that are interesting and, and relevant at the moment. So, anyway, I just want to let you know that I, I am the co-founder and chief investment officer at Sachem Cove Partners LLC, and due to industry regulations. I don't discuss any of Sachem Cove's funds on this podcast, and and all the opinions expressed by the podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Sachem Cove or its affiliates. And this podcast is for informational purposes only, and it should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients and or affiliates of Sachem Cove partners may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. Hope you have a great week, and I'll be back next week with, uh, with another interesting guest. Thank you. The information presented on Talking Stocks Over a Beer is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.